Okay, thank you. Um, welcome to everybody. My, my name is Chris Nimi. I'm with uh, Energy Futures Group, and I'm serving as the moderator of, uh, of this webinar. Uh, we appreciate your patience as we've worked through uh, some, some technical difficulties here. Um, this is a webinar on energy efficiency financing or financing tools for, uh, for energy efficiency programs. Uh, it is being sponsored by the Regulatory Assistance Project um, with the uh, funding of the Energy Foundation. Uh, it is the, uh, the fifth in a series of webinars that, that RAP has hosted along these lines, um, addressing a variety of different energy efficiency topics in order to help Energy Foundation grantees, uh, regulatory staff, and others become better informed on key energy efficiency topics. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, the Regulatory Assistance Project, or RAP, uh, is a nonprofit organization. It's um, funded through foundations like Ener the Energy Foundation and Climate Works, as well as through uh, government agencies such as the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, in order to provide policy and technical assistance to policymakers and regulators. Um, today, we have a couple of uh, distinguished um, experts um, with terrific expertise in um, uh, energy efficiency and particularly uh, financing um, offers to support investments in energy efficiency. Um, I'll introduce you to uh, the, the two of them as they take the, the podium. Um, before we get started, however, I wanted to run through a few um, administrative or logistic issues. Uh, the first is to note that because we have uh, quite a number of um, participants in the webinar, uh, and probably more uh, still to come. Um, we're, we've got everybody muted, uh, other than the presenters. Um, however, we will invite questions uh, that you can pose as the presentations are proceeding um, in the messages section in the, in the, uh, the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, I will, uh, as the moderator, take, take note of the questions that come in try to keep an ongoing um, uh, record of them uh, so that when the two speakers are finished, uh, I, can, I can pose them to the, to the speakers on your behalf. We may not get to all of them, but we'll, we'll do our best. Uh, secondly, as, as you probably heard, um, the webinar is being recorded. Um, the, the, the reason for that is so that anyone who can't make the webinar uh, in real time right now um, can go on to the Regulatory Assistance Project's website, that's www.raponline.org, uh, to, um, to, to hear the whole, uh, uh, the whole present, uh, series of presentations being made. And of course, um, if you are uh, so enthralled uh, by going through it the first time that you want to come back a second or third time, uh, you're welcome to do that as well. The, the, uh, the third thing I wanted to mention before we get started is that um, at the end of the, the presentation, um, we, there will be uh, evaluation forms that we would love for you uh, to uh, be able to um, uh, uh, fill out for us so that we can get feedback on, on how we're doing. And uh, in order to, to get to that point, we would request that when you leave the webinar, you, you click on the, the X uh, where it says exit in, uh, in the um, upper right hand of the webinar uh, page of, of your screen rather than simply exiting your browser. If you do that, you'll get a, a very short um, survey that, uh, again, we'd, we'd really appreciate if you could, if you could fill out. Um, we're going to try to uh, see if the, if the speakers can get through their presentations in 45 minutes or so each so that we've got two hours for the whole thing. That will leave um, 15 minutes uh, for questions after both Peter and Dennis's um, presentations. So um, without uh, further ado, uh, oh, someone's asked if we can stop the pinging noise. Um, uh, let's see. I think if I, if I press uh, star 8, that will get... Uh, my chimes on and off, so let me try that. Uh, thank you for that suggestion. We'll, uh, I'll make a note to make sure that we do that on an ongoing basis in the future. Um, okay, so uh, uh, let's, uh, let me start by um, introducing to you um, Peter uh, Adamchuk. Um, Peter uh, uh, is the, the head of all things uh, financing for the Vermont Energy Investment Corporation. Uh, he has a, a long history uh, prior to joining the energy efficiency industry um, working on, on financing uh, in New York City and San Francisco and, and elsewhere. Um, and he, uh, for the last couple of years, he's been uh, trying to uh, help DEIC 
uh, more effectively bring financing pr products, particularly innovative ones, uh, to make its energy efficiency programs more effective. So uh, without further ado, um, Peter, you have the floor. Thanks very much, Chris, and welcome, everybody. Um, I'm going to begin uh, this presentation by talking through the, um, as this title implies, the need for and the role of financing. Um, the, the topic of the need for is, is perhaps a little more convoluted than you might um, think, and we'll, we'll come at that from several different uh, directions, but um, we'll, we'll proceed. So the first thing I'd like to do is to start with some definitions and um, to make the statement that, that when you're spending money on energy efficiency, and this applies equally to renewables, um, what you're doing is investing rather than expending money. And um, I, I uh, did a little research on it. I found these definitions, and to, to spend is to use up or pay out, but to invest is to spend money now for a future advantage or benefit. And that's precisely what you're doing when you're spending money on energy efficiency because you have a pre-existing uh, cost, and what you're seeking to do is to either reduce it through efficiency or to, in the case of renewables, uh, which is not the focus of today's presentation, but this, uh, this concept applies equally there. Um, in the case of renewables, when you're generating your own uh, energy on site, you're reducing your uh, need for energy from elsewhere, uh, and that um, is the, um, is the um, in return on investment. So, um, but it gets, it gets more complicated than that because um, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the concept of the megawatt, the, the energy that you don't use. Well, there's an um, investment corollary to that, and that is that the return on investment from energy investments is the money that is not spent on the uh, watts that you didn't use, the megawatts. So this requires an extra step. What you need to do to, to calculate a return on investment um, for an energy investment is to look at your actual cost and then determine what your cost would have been. Um, and the difference between those two is the ROI, or return on investment. Um, our lives would all be a lot easier if people's bills arrived saying, this is what you actually have to pay and this is what you would have had to pay. Um, but uh, it doesn't, um, it doesn't uh, work that way for us. Um, the second point to make in comparing energy investments to traditional investments is that the um, traditional investments, whoops, I'm sorry that this screen is jumping on me. I apologize. Um, the, the, the second point is that the traditional investments, by which I mean stocks and bonds and things like that, you buy them for a price, at some point you sell them for a price, or in the case of a bond, perhaps it matures, and that's part of your return on investment. You might get coupon payments or, or dividends along the way, and you have a sales price at the end. One of the um, most confounding things about evaluating energy investments is the lack of standardization around what the final uh, value of that investment is. Uh, and that's what I mean when I say unless the energy improvements add to resale value, uh, and that's a topic we will come back to um, repeatedly throughout this presentation. Um, while we're continuing with definitions, I'd like to uh, clear up these two words, funding and financing, are often um, interchanged. Um, as you can see on this screen, the definition of funding that, that I'm using here is essentially money that is given, grants, direct incentives, um, interest rate subsidies, tax credits, and so on. Um, that's not what we're here to talk about today. What we're talking about is financing strategies, um, which are ways to allow the payments that are coming from the property owner um, to be used most effectively to, uh, to make payments to um, pay for energy improvements over time, again, in keeping with the theme of, of energy investments as, a, uh, as an investment. So um, I'm going to go through a few of the most common financing myths. Um, these are things that come up again and again uh, in conversations, and I think it's useful to, to um, lay them out there. Uh, I don't have answers for all of them, but these are things that come up uh, repeatedly. Um, the first one is that information is sufficient. If we can just simply give people uh, the facts, they will make rational decisions and move forward. Um, I can tell you that prior to working in the energy field, I worked in traditional investment advising for 23 years, and people did not make rational investment decisions there either, so I wouldn't expect uh, that to carry over to here. Um, it's more complicated than that. Um, the second one is, is very much on the topic of, of today, and that is that an adequately attractive financing program is sufficient. Um, and so frequently people say, well, if they were just financing available, we would simply be able to um, 
um, go forward. And as we'll see again through our conversations, that has not at all been the case uh, historically um, throughout the United States and Canada um, and some of the studies that we'll cite. Um, next is that this can all pay for itself out of savings. Um, this is really a, a, a sort of a more specific case of the first bullet and simply saying if you can just demonstrate the economics of this, people will, um, will understand and they'll, they'll just move forward. Um, and uh, this is something that is frequently termed the efficiency gap where people can see the value of an energy investment but they don't act on it. Um, continuing on to the next page, um, the, uh, there are additional, and we're, I'm hanging here for a second, but we'll hopefully be moving forward. Um, the, um, well, I'm going to keep talking on the next. Oh, here we go. So the more, more common financing myths. Um, this next one here is uh, that most comprehensive energy improvements have short paybacks. Um, now, uh, let's say a couple of things about paybacks. The concept of payback is, is simply, um, it's frequently someone takes uh, the cost of an energy measure uh, they divide it by the um, expected energy savings per year and come up with a with a simple number, you know, 3.4, 5.8 uh, years. And a lot of people, especially in the business world, um, talk about paybacks as as a, as a demand. You know, this project must have less than a three-year payback. Um, there are two reasons why I think this is faulty reasoning. First one is. Paybacks play to all our worst human emotions. You know, someone says, four years. Oh, my God, four years, that's a long time. Um, if instead you say this is a 25% return on investment, well, that's, that's fantastic. Um, and I, I do think that there is a very common um, double standard, especially, again, in the business world, where people uh, look at the um, payback of an energy project and say that's not good enough, where, in fact, if they were looking at another potential business investment, they would, they would jump on it. Um, the second point about paybacks is, is ultimately perhaps more important, and that is that payback focuses only on getting your original investment back, and it doesn't pay attention to the savings to be obtained in the future. Um, it is not at all uncommon for a project to have a three- or four-year payback that then continues to pay out for an additional 10, 15 years in energy savings before equipment needs to be replaced. And by focusing on only the three or four years of getting your, your uh, original investment back, um, people fail to understand that the, the real rationale for an energy investment is frequently what happens after the, um, uh, the original investment has been recouped and the additional energy savings continue to go. Um, the next uh, point is about revolving loan programs. Um, it's frequently the case that people say, we just have to come up with some money, uh, we'll create this revolving loan fund, we'll um, lend money out, people will pay it back, and it will just, um, it'll, you know, perpetual motion, it'll just keep going. Um, that's not true for several reasons. One is, first of all, some pr uh, projects, some deeper savings projects, require multi-year financing in order to be viable. Um, that then means that the funds in a revolving loan fund are tied up for quite a substantial amount of time. And yes, it's true that the initial loans uh, are helpful in the, in the initial projects, but uh, it turns out that that's not a very good way to, to reach a broad um, uh, section of a, of a population uh, to do that. Um, the, the next two points are that um, even though these kinds of loans typically have very low default rates, many programs experience default rates well below 1%, um, even so, defaults do occur, and to the extent that they occur, they um, eat into the original principle of the program. And finally, there are administration costs associated with running programs about uh, debt collection and administration, uh, sending out bill statements and so on. And over time, those costs can, um, can eat into the reserve as well. Um, finally, and this is a, an, an important one again for this topic, is that ESCOs or energy savings companies can do it all. Um, we will be talking uh, more about the specifics of ESCOs later, but for right now, this is a business model in which uh, a provider can um, uh, do a series of energy measures at no upfront cost to a property owner, and the property owner will obtain savings and they have guarantees. Um, people often say, um, you know, if this really is a good investment, then let the private sector provide that service. Um, and it's true that ESCOs do provide the service um, to quite a large scale. It's a six to seven billion dollar a year industry. Um, however, ESCOs uh, typically only operate in certain sections of the um, housing stock. About 80% uh, of ESCO work is done in the public sector. 
a sector that only uses about 20% of the uh, energy overall in the in the building stock. So it's quite focused in one part of the market. And also, um, ESCOs typically will only do projects of a million dollars or more. So there's an enormous unserved and underserved portion of the uh, building stock um, that ESCOs just don't reach. Um, so the private sector has a solution, but it is not available to the vast majority of, of potential customers. Um, this is a quote that I saw a couple years back and that I think really captures um, the, the issue here, it says that 80% uh, of CEOs and CFOs said they would not spend money to make their factories more efficient and save money in the long run if it hurt their next quarter bottom line. And the quote is that that's functionally insane. Um, this is a pervasive attitude. There are people who, this maybe says more about, about public um, businesses um, in America than it does about energy specifically, but um, this is a tough nut to crack. If you're, if you're um, reviewing a potential measure and any negative in the next three to six months is going to preclude you from going forward, uh, it's an enormous challenge to make, um, to make projects work, even projects that ultimately can be uh, enormously lucrative. So the next slide, and again, I'm hanging here for just a second. So now I'm going to go through some of the conventional uh, financing options. And I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I think these are, are um, uh, well understood by, I imagine, most people on the phone here, but just uh, for purposes of comparing them to uh, some of the more innovative ideas that we're going to talk about later. Uh, and I apologize that the screen is taking a moment to load, but I'll, I'll carry on. Uh, so the first one is consumer loans from banks and credit unions. And obviously for people who are able to qualify for these, um, this is a, an, an obvious and a, a readily available method of, um, of financing uh, energy efficiency. Uh, the next one, home equity loans, is really um, uh, an example of for those people who have the credit scores, who have the income um, available to get uh, bank loans, using your equity in uh, a property, your home. Here we go. We're on that screen now. I'm on the second bullet. Um, having the um, ability to leverage the, the equity you have in your property to um, get financing for energy can be a very attractive return on investment. Um, and it is uh, often used by people who have a longer term horizon, people who expect to stay in a property or to own a property for many years to come. Um, mortgage financing even more so, um, but it, it also presents that even larger obstacle, people's willingness to take on 30 year debt to finance um, energy. Uh, it's a common complaint that people are not willing to look uh, that far. Um, leasing is an interesting option. Um, many people don't think of leasing because leasing typically is for is regarded as something for a very tangible asset like a you know copying machine or a fire truck or something. And when people use leasing for energy efficiency, oftentimes they're saying, "What exactly is my what's my collateral? You know, is someone going to come back and and repossess the uh, insulation out of the attic if I don't uh, make payments?" But in fact, leasing is quite a commonly used uh, route. Um, especially by businesses. Um, it offers some very attractive uh, tax treatment and uh, uh, depreciation schedules, which can make it um, uh, by far the best um, route for a, a business, especially a business that is unable or unwilling to take on uh, debt onto their balance sheet. Uh, next, energy performance contracting is uh, the, the model uh, that the ESCOs use that I was describing earlier. Um, it is a model where one party uh, does the measures and guarantees the savings. In order to do that, they have to have uh, substantial financial resources. Um, they have to have a, um, a good deal of capital and a, and a balance sheet that uh, can back up a financial guarantee. Um, that, again, is a big part of the reason of why the ESCO model is, um, is really only prevalent in very large uh, transactions because um, those companies go after those kinds of projects rather than smaller ones. Um, and finally, business loans. Obviously, this is just another permutation of what we're talking about here. Um, one comment to make is that many businesses, uh, the way they are structured, um, often they're limited liability companies, businesses that own buildings um, and have uh, difficulty in obtaining uh, financing um, to finance energy efficiency um, or indeed anything. Uh, borrowing is always a problem for, for businesses. So, um, Moving on to the experience to date with uh, conventional financing, um, the, um, the experience that has taken place in over 150 energy finance programs uh, throughout North America over the last 10 plus years has been the take up has been less than half a percent per year. 
So what that means is out of a, out of a population of, of, uh, of 100,000 um, eligible customers, let's say, um, fewer than 500 would actually take up that um, financing option in any given year. That's a, that's a very low rate of return. Uh, and in fact, in many of these programs, it's been substantially lower than that. And there are lots of reasons given, including skepticism, uh, poor uh, marketing, understanding of what these programs are. But by far, one of the most universal pieces of feedback is that people are worried about borrowing a lot of money up front and then waiting to get their savings back over time. They're concerned they might not be the property owner um, in the future. They might sell the property before they um, pay themselves back. There's that payback concept again. And um, frequently people don't act even when uh, the economics are extremely compelling. So that's, that's a major um, obstacle in, uh, in this, uh, this vicious cycle of uh, people recognizing that these are uh, economic um, projects, but they don't uh, act on them for the reason I just stated. Um, the next one, uh, energy financing programs mostly serve those who least need them. Um, anything that is based on people's credit, ability to pay, and so on is necessarily going to um, preclude quite a large section of the population from being able to take advantage of that. Um, it, it really boils down to if you can qualify for a loan, you probably don't need it. Um, and that's, that's been a very common uh, experience with these kinds of programs is that the people who, who really can't do this without the financing are unable to qualify for the um, for the loans. Uh, and the next one is that financing programs often um, result in, um, in less substantial energy savings projects. Uh, people tend to skim the cream. If they uh, are looking at a project and there's you know, lighting, for example, that has a two or three year payback and then there's some um, heavier duty work that might be done that has a seven or eight year payback, if you combine the two, you can get quite an attractive uh, return on the whole project, but it's a very common uh, for people to say, well, I'll just borrow the smaller amount of money for less time and, and do less savings. So that's certainly understandable from a human nature point of view, um, but it's, if our goal is to maximize energy savings and, um, and derive the economic benefits from that over time, um, that's working against us. So um, as I, I think is becoming clear as I'm going through, there are some pretty substantial barriers to be overcome here. Um, the first one is the limited investment horizon, the payback of which I've already spoken. Um, the second one is, is uh, again, just basic human emotions, reluctance to incur debt. Um, a lot of people just can't get um, themselves over uh, the hurdle of borrowing money for something that is um, as invisible as energy efficiency, um, and that's something that needs to be um, addressed. Uh, the third point about the poor availability of suitable financial products, what I mean by that is um, that if the en energy savings are not being counted in the underwriting decision about qualifying for a loan, the only way to qualify for a loan is if you have other assets. So in effect, you're going and borrowing money. You could be borrowing money for any purpose. It's not, um, it's not including the projected energy savings in the, um, in the process. Um, the security of repayment is just making reference to the fact that, uh, again, many people who, who need uh, financing to make this work are just unable to qualify. And then finally, the hassle factor is an interesting one because um, even though in aggregate the amounts of money we're talking about and the energy savings and the, uh, you know, the, the greenhouse gas impact and so on is, is absolutely massive, for individual households, energy expense is not typically a major expense when you look at uh, rent or mortgage, you look at um, insurance, you look at transportation costs and so on, um, those can typically be 10 times as large as energy costs in, in many households. Um, however, interestingly, I would point out that if you look at the costs of home ownership after the mortgage, um, the big three are energy, property taxes, and homeowner's insurance. And it is quite common for energy to be larger than uh, either of the other two. So uh, I think people... Uh, who get multiple um, bills, maybe they get a separate electric bill from a gas bill, for example, and they come in once a month and so on. I think many people would be shocked if they totaled up the, a 12-month running total of all of their energy bills, um, but people typically don't do that. And so they look at the, the hassle factor of addressing this um, and frequently um, uh, choose to do nothing. So the uh, couple points that I want to go through uh, that are key issues in, in looking at financing for energy efficiency. Uh, the first one is, is uh, if um, the loan is being secured by the credit of the borrower, uh, that presents a lot of issues, as I, as I have mentioned um, 
several times now. In fact, uh, only about 50% of uh, the U.S. population has a credit score that is considered good and that would allow them to, um, to um, borrow money based simply on their own credit. Um, I, I heard a quote recently, a gentleman named Gil Sperling, who's the program manager for the Department of Energy Office of Weatherization, said at a conference recently, investors and lenders have stated that energy efficiency financing cannot be scalable if it relies purely on consumer creditworthiness. And I, I think those, that's, um, that's excellent um, insight, and it points to the fact that a market-based solution is just not going to reach um, anything close to the number of people who need financing, and, uh, and indeed many of the people that it reaches don't really need that additional assistance, um, so it's, it's misdirected as well. Um, the second point is uh, programs that are secured by the cash flow of utility payments. That's what um, Dennis will be focusing on um, later on with his discussion of on-bill financing, so I won't say much about it, except to say it says raises issues around disconnection, and that point is simply that um, in the residential market, um, the assumption that a utility will turn off um, you know, someone's heat in February in New England uh, is not very realistic. You know, for public relations reasons and so on, in the residential, and I'm, and I'm underscoring residential, um, it's it's, do, it's a dubious proposition that that uh, threat will actually be acted upon, and therefore um, it's, it's unlikely that it adds uh, as much protection as one might think. In the commercial market, I would, um, I would agree that it is, it is quite, uh, um, quite helpful. And then the, the final point secured by property um, is largely around PACE, Property Assessed Clean Energy, and I'll be um, getting into that um, shortly. So I'll say no more about it right now. Uh, the next point is the term of repayment, and what uh, I'd like to highlight here is that savings can be netted against, and future energy savings can be netted against future loan payments to help um, ease the burden of, of making those loan payments. And ideally, if the loan is structured long enough, um, it can um, allow a pr uh, property owner to pay for their energy savings um, without any additional out-of-pocket, and I will have an example, an example that I'll discuss um, shortly. Um, however, as I, as I alluded to earlier, one of the issues is um, some of these projects can be quite substantial investments, and there just is no um, standard in the market about how much value is added to a building um, due to retrofits. Um, in the renewable market, there have been some studies showing that solar panels can add value and so on, um, those are more tangible, visible uh, contributions. Energy efficiency is largely uh, invisible, and that's, uh, that presents um, issues uh, in terms of uh, valuing it to a potential buyer. Um, and this last one uh, is something that is often referred to as a split incentive. Um, the building owner uh, frequently is investing in their building. Uh, if they have tenants who are paying their own energy bills, um, you have a situation where the person who's being asked to spend the money uh, is not reaping the economic benefit. Um, one way to address that, especially in the commercial market, is something called a green lease, where a, uh, a building owner and a tenant will enter into a contract, typically that matches the length of the lease of the, of the um, tenant, uh, which will allow the uh, building owner to put some money down and get some money back from the tenant, share in the energy savings uh, over the remaining life of the lease and help the um, uh, the property owner justified the expense of the, uh, of the uh, energy investment. So let me just walk through an example here um, very quickly. This is um, a New England home. So as you can see, it's got a very substantial fuel cost. Uh, in other parts of the country, this might be a very large electric bill. It's the exact same principle. So what we're assuming here is that this, uh, this building, prior to um, engaging in an energy uh, efficiency uh, retrofit, um, was spending a little over $4,600 a year on their energy bill. After investing $20,000, which they borrowed at 5% interest, um, to um, increase the fitness, energy fitness of this, this property, their savings were cut in half. They're, they were spending half as much money, 2336 in this example. You can see that that's highlighted down below. And what um, this chart is attempting to um, show you is that if you assume energy prices are not going to go up over the next 20 years, however ludicrous you personally think that is, that's the assumption in this analysis, if you then look at what your annual payments would be to pay off $20,000 at 5% interest over a 5, a 10, a 15, or a 20-year payment, what you can see is that if you have to pay the money back in five years, 
you're going to have to come up with an additional $2,194 each of those five years in addition to your energy savings. If you're able to push the loan out to 10 years, um, you only have to come up with an extra $210 each of those 10 years from other sources. Um, if you're able to go out to 15 or 20 years, you see that you've got positive cash flow from year one. And what that means is that you could borrow this money and you would instantly be um, ahead financially. You would have, in, in addition to all the non-economic benefits, you would have your loan payments plus your energy bill would be less than your energy bills were previously um, and would continue to be so throughout the life of the 20 years. And if, in fact, energy prices do go up, that situation would only improve. Um, I'm a big believer in a picture being worth a thousand words, and so uh, this next slide is simply attempting to graphically show what I just said. So this light blue is the loan payment in the one in the graph above, and the black is the um, energy savings. So what this top chart is showing you graphically is if you borrow money for, in this example, uh, eight years, what you're having to do is come, have to come up with the difference uh, between the black line and the blue line. That's money you have to come up with from elsewhere. And it's not until you get out until the ninth year when you've paid off this loan that you begin to have money flowing back to you. So these future savings come back to you only after you um, have had to uh, use other financial resources to pay this loan off. Uh, if you look at the bottom chart, what it's showing you is, again, the black is the energy savings. If this loan is structured so that you're able to have um, uh, your payments be less than your energy savings, then, in fact, you don't have to come up with any money at all. And, in fact, the difference between the um, loan payments and the energy savings is, is profit, if you will. It's money that you're ahead in the current year. Um, and that is the concept of positive cash flow. So let's talk about some of the, um, of the um, more promising developmental uh, financing options that are going on. Um, the first one is the, um, uh, the ESCO model, the Energy Performance Contracting Variant. There's something called a public purpose ESCO. And the difference between a public purpose ESCO and a, and a traditional ESCO is that a, a public purpose ESCO is, is, uh, targets maximizing savings uh, to return a, um, uh, a required minimum. I, I'm still waiting for this page to respond. I'll try one more time. Um, I will continue on. And mortgage financing variants. This is a very interesting one in that there are actually products that are out there. Some of them have been in place for years. Uh, energy improvement mortgages, energy efficiency mortgages. Um, there are programs that are available through Fannie Mae, through the Federal Housing um, Agency, through the VA. And these are programs that allow homeowners who qualify to, um, I do apologize that this page is not uh, moving forward. I'm going to continue. Um, that these uh, mortgage financing variants allow you to um, borrow additional money and take into consideration the energy savings that are um, likely to be obtained uh, in order to um, approve that. Chris, I, I'm getting a message saying end of slideshow at the end of, at this slide, and I'm not uh, able to go forward. Okay. Um, I don't know if you have any suggestions for me. Yeah, I see the same thing, and um, I, uh, I I don't. Uh, let me see All if right. I can. Shall I just continue, up. and we'll hope uh, that we, the vis me, uh, visuals can catch up. Give me 15 seconds here to see if I can pull up, um, if I can close this out and pull it up and uh, pull up a, uh, the next slide number. Hang, give, me, okay. give me just a second here. Sure. Apologies for that, folks. Uh, so I will, I will continue to talk about this particular slide, which hopefully we'll be looking at in just a moment. So um, the benefit of the uh, mortgage financing variance is that um, for those people who qualify, who have um, equity in a, in a home and who are willing to uh, take on debt for a lengthy period of time. There are products that exist that allow you to um, take out loans for um, lengthy periods of time, which allows you to have positive cash flow. Here we go. And, um, and uh, allows you to uh, finance energy improvements now. Okay, let's see if I'm able to move forward. Here we go. Very good. Thanks, Chris. Um, next is on-bill financing. Again, the second presenter, Dennis, will be speaking about this uh, in more detail, so I'm going to leave it to him. I will mention that in addition to 
Um, Connecticut, uh, where uh, Dennis's program is run, uh, there are some programs in Illinois and New York. NYSERDA recently um, uh, has enacted a very uh, large program, which is to be rolled out over the course of the next year. Um, the, the concept is that the uh, loan runs with the meter. So if you've got uh, an, an electric meter on a, a property, you can um, do improvements, pay back the loans through your, in addition to an additional line on your energy bill, and if you uh, move on from the property to elsewhere, the subsequent tenant will take on those payments, which they should be willing to do because they're also um, enjoying the energy savings. Uh, next is property assessed clean energy. I have several slides on that, and so I will, I will um, come back to that momentarily. Um, and finally is the loan loss reserve. Um, that's something that's been talked about a great deal. Um, loan loss reserves are an idea that um, are based on taking a small amount of money and uh, using it as a catalyst, using it to leverage private financing. Um, the problem with the loan loss reserve concept is you have to start with that um, certain amount of money. Um, interestingly, the ERA stimulus dollars have presented um, a ready answer to that um, problem, which previously was, was uh, largely insurmountable for many programs, and that is that um, when ERA dollars have been available, uh, frequently, they have been um, suggested to be used in a loan loss reserve fund because a small amount of what's called sessionary money, money that you don't have to pay back, can be placed at risk, um, which allows private money, which does expect repayment, uh, to be much more comfortable to be, um, to be used. And this can have a, a multiplier effect and allow um, many uh, more dollars to be brought to bear. Okay? Um, I'm going to talk about the public purpose ESCO a little more now. Uh, again, the, the ESCO model um, is, is one where uh, there's, for, for no money down, a property owner is able to um, enter into energy saving measures and uh, the future savings will, um, will, will be available to make payments. And in the event the savings do not emerge, the ESCO will guarantee that. The public purpose ESCO is a different concept. It's um, it sets a baseline rate of return, and it seeks to do all cost-effective measures uh, as, so long as the blended return on investment of all measures um, exceeds that target rate. Um, because of this, the, a public purpose ESCO will tend to um, have larger projects than a traditional ESCO would for the same property. It'll have uh, deeper savings. It'll have, as I said earlier, a lower rate of return, and that typically also means a longer loan term necessary to obtain cash flow. Um, another picture that's worth a thousand words um, is the next slide, and that is showing that the um, the public purpose uh, ESCO, as contrasted with the ESCO model, which I hope we'll be looking at momentarily. Here we go. So. Um, as you can see, the, the traditional ESCO hurdle rate, there are a lot of uh, setup costs. There's a lot of these projects tend to be large. There's a lot of uh, investment in, in technical assessment determining what uh, work to be done. A traditional ESCO will do those few measures that are most um, profitable. Um, and uh, by profitable, in fairness, you could say uh, profitable to the ESCO and also returning the highest rate of energy savings to the building owner. But uh, because the ESCO model is a for-profit model, um, ESCOs will pick the highest returning measures and stop. They will, they will not go deep. And it is not uncommon for ESCOs to have 25% rates of return on their, um, on their measures. By contrast, a public purpose ESCO would set a target rate um, below which they would not go. And on this graph, it's about I don't know, 7 or 8% and would continue to do all measures that would screen, that would, that would show being cost effective at that cost of capital. And um, that blue area on this graph could, could be described as um, the transference of money from the profit of the ESCO to the investment in the building for the property owner. Um, and uh, you can see that this could have a dramatic effect on the energy savings uh, to be obtained um, in the building which is why it's referred to as public purpose, because um, it serves the broader public purposes of um, uh, leveraging financing to create deep energy savings. And um, the transparency in the project pricing allows the building owner to understand um, better what is uh, uh, being done and the rates of return for the various work. Um, it allows um, 
technologies other than those that are just the most obvious, like uh, efficient lighting and variable speed fans and so on. Uh, it allows other technologies to be uh, introduced into this model, whereas typically these days they're not. Um, and um, by virtue of being able to go after smaller projects than a typical ESCOs would do, it is able to reach um, sectors of the market that, that are, are not served by this model right now. Um, as you can see, it's a it's a Interesting idea. It's a it's a idea with a tremendous amount of potential. It has not yet been successfully implemented. Um, the reasons for that are the the um, the setup and the development of this business at the start requires a pretty substantial um, investment before uh, the project the the model becomes sustainable. Uh, although many people uh, are looking at this, no one, to my knowledge, has yet um, successfully uh, rolled out a program of this kind. But I do think it's something that we'll hear more of um, in the in the months and years to come. Uh, moving on to PACE, this is something that I actually personally spend a lot of, bit, a lot of time on. Um, PACE is a, um, a voluntary mechanism. It's, it's something that you opt into if you wish to. It's not, uh, not uh, imposed on anybody. It's only people who wish to um, participate. Um, it is a way to fund eligible energy improvements by borrowing money through your municipality. So the underlying premise is just like on-bill financing says you have a meter on your house and you already are receiving a bill, um, PACE says you already are there's already a lien on your property from your town and you're already receiving a property tax bill. So that's the mechanism that we can use to, um, to make money available to you and to get repayment. Um, typically, PACE allows repayment for up to a period of 20 years, which is um, huge because uh, it allows for positive cash flow. And a key point is that um, just as property taxes stay with the property when you sell it, the buyer takes on the obligation to pay the property taxes, likewise with assessments. And so with a PACE assessment, you would pay the uh, assessment while you are the owner of the property. And at the time of sale, that assessment would become the obligation of the buyer, uh, which again makes sense because they are ob obtaining the energy savings. Or um, PACE programs typically allow the assessment to be paid off at time of sale at which point the buyer and seller could renegotiate a, a sales price. Um, uh, PACE has really swept the nation. It's, it's rather remarkable. The first PACE legislation took place in California in November 2008. Um, within um, not much more than two years, 26 states in the District of Columbia enacted PACE legislation. Um, I think that's something to really um, think about for a minute because that means that 26 separate state legislatures took up this topic and were able to see the benefit of it and enact laws. Um, as you look at the map, you can see we're talking about red states and blue states. Um, this is an idea that really has appeal um, and clearly to have um, um, had that kind of implementation in such a short period of time. Um, as you can see at the bottom, uh, for those of you that are not aware, uh, just over a year ago, the Federal Housing Financing Agency, the FHFA, um, stated their objections to uh, the fact that, that the assessment uh, model was being used. Their objection lay in the fact that the, uh, in a default, um, property taxes are paid first, assessments are paid second, and then mortgages are paid uh, after those two have been paid. Uh, they stated their objection to the lien for a PACE assessment being senior to a mortgage, even though all assessments, there are about 37,000 uh, special assessment districts in the country, and they're all senior to mortgages. Um, FHFA chose to single out the only ones that actually pay for themselves um, to um, um, object to. Um, they, they are the regulator for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and the federal home loan banks, and they instructed those uh, entities uh, not to purchase any mortgages that had senior lien um, PACE assessments. Uh, as a result of that, Fannie and Freddie instructed all the banks that they did business with, uh, likewise, that they would not um, be willing to purchase these. And this had the effect of having banks throughout the country say, I cannot make loans to anybody who, um, who has a PACE assessment or indeed who could take on a PACE assessment that would be senior to this mortgage because then the bank would be unable to sell the the mortgage to Fannie and Freddie. Uh, and even today, Fannie and Freddie between them purchase more than 50% of all residential mortgages. And I do need to stress, this affects the residential mortgage only. Um, uh, the FHFA does not have um, jurisdiction over um, commercial. Um, quite recently, just in the last few days, a bill was introduced in the House uh, which seeks to address the issues that were raised by um, the FHFA. Um, they would require that in order to participate in a PACE program, you'd have to have a minimum amount of equity. 
Um, it would cap the size of the assessment at 10% of the home value. And uh, importantly, it would say that the lien could not accelerate. And what that means is the obligation uh, to pay the assessment uh, is just to keep it current, just like property taxes. So in a default, uh, the PACE assessment would not have to be paid off in full. It would just be brought current, and the buyer would assume the um, future payments as well as the future energy savings. And then finally, and this is um, uh, quite key from a financial point of view, the requirement of, in this bill is that um, all work financed by a PACE assessment would have to have um, positive cash flow. It would have to have what's called an SIR, a savings to investment ratio, greater than one. And the Department of Energy has put out a proposed formula uh, that calculates the um, net present value of the cost of the, of the measures against the net present value of the f expected energy savings um, using a, um, a price escalator that's provided by the, um, the uh, Energy Information Administration and um, we'll see what happens with this in the courts, but it's, a, it's an interesting um, development because it shows that the, uh, the proponents of PACE are attempting to um, address the concerns that were raised by the, um, by the uh, bank regulators. So um, t t a few words about uh, loan loss reserves. Um, they are providing a partial risk coverage. There's a pool of money that is... Um, that is designated uh, as being available to cover losses from a lender. By lender, I could mean a bank of any financial institution. Uh, could be a bond um, buyer. Um, under certain predetermined um, conditions, they would um, uh, be able to draw on these. Um, a very important point to make is that a loan loss reserve is not a guarantee. The difference being a guarantee is is um, that somebody will make good if there are losses. A loan loss reserve is that there is a particular amount of money set aside uh, that is available to cover losses. If actual losses should exceed the amount in the loan loss reserve, the, there is no recourse. It is um, the loss of the lender. Um, as these things are um, constructed, um, they are typically uh, viewed with a portfolio approach. And what I mean by that is um, if you look at... Um, uh, historical default rates, if they are under 1%, you might construct a loan loss reserve with, say, a 2% level, um, which would allow um, the loan loss reserve to endure uh, losses at the expected level and not require any additional funding. So a, a well-developed program has a loan loss reserve that is larger than the expectation of defaults. Um, again, this portfolio approach means that uh, a few loans defaulting will, will have a very small impact on the total overall portfolio, and by pooling the risk in multiple loans, um, it allows a loan loss reserve to cover uh, a, a broad range of, of similar loans. Um, and as I said, the loan loss reserve is capped. It is a finite number. Any losses above that are the lender's losses. Those are often termed second losses. Um, so I listed some of these financing options. Um, what are some of the barriers to uh, addressing them? Uh, with energy performance contracting, it's the, um, the profit of the ESCO versus the objective of obtaining deep savings. Again, I'm, I'm not against profit. I'm just highlighting the fact that the business model, um, which can be very advantageous, bringing uh, an opportunity for uh, energy savings for buildings with no money down, um, does in fact uh, almost of necessity uh, indicate that you'd have low levels of savings rather than going deep, and as a public policy, um, that's that is less than desirable. And secondly, the economies of scale, the ESCO market operates in million dollars and up, and um, that just leaves an awful lot of us with uh, with this being not available to them. Um, the mortgage financing variants. There's a, a couple of points. There's the um, the, the lack of confidence in the future savings. Um, there are some behavioral issues. There's a, there's a phrase where you say people take their savings in comfort. Um, if somebody couldn't afford their uh, gas bill and kept their thermostat at 50, and all of a sudden they have an efficient house and they bump the thermostat up to 68, well, they might not get anything like the savings that, that would have been indicated, um, but they're, they're a lot more comfortable in their home. So that's the kind of uh, skepticism that, that often is um, is stated. Um, there's also institutional barriers, especially at time of sale. There are many vested interests in the, in the real estate market, realtors and so on, who um, look at this as just one more thing that can go wrong, uh, one more piece of paper, one more obstacle, potentially one more 
uh, negotiation point between buyer and seller. And so um, uh, historically, we've found that a lot of people who are in this industry are not um, interested in going first uh, in providing these, these, uh, these options to, to buyers. Um, continuing on with the on-bill financing, um, some of the issues, and again, Dennis will be, will be speaking, so I will... Um, um, not go into too much detail, but um, it, across the country where programs that have worked have worked best where customers do not have multiple uh, providers for energy. So if you, have, if you receive an electric bill from one company and a gas bill from another, if your um, energy savings bill is coming on the electric bill, for example, the electric utility might be reluctant to be the bearer of bad news. If you have uh, performance issues with your, with your um Thermal improvements, you might not want to pay your electric bill and so on, and so that can cause um, um, consternation on the part of the utilities. Um, it does require a pretty proactive utility to uh, make changes to their billing systems. There are issues about what happens if um, uh, insufficient payment is made, how do you prorate partial payments, and so on. So there's a lot of uh, details that, that can bog this down. And then finally, it's, it's sort of the mindset. You know, many utilities say financing is not our core business, and it's not really something that we should be, um, that we should be looking at. Um, in PACE, clearly it's the lean position. Um, this is working its way through the courts. There are several lawsuits, um, most notably by the um, Attorney General of California, um, against the FHFA. Um, that could take literally years to work its way through the courts. Um, I mentioned earlier that there's some legislation and um, uh, you know, we will see what happens with that. Uh, in the meantime, a few places, uh, Vermont uh, has introduced a, a junior lien PACE um, program, which is going live next year. Maine has a junior lien program as well, although it is fully funded by ERA dollars, and so I'm not sure that's really a, a, a replicable model for others to follow. Um, one thing that uh, FHFA said that, that I do think has a, a good bit of merit is the lack of national standards. Um, the fact that all 26 states and the District of Columbia have differing um, PACE program parameters and, um, and that they, um, it's, it's quite difficult to compare across programs, makes it very difficult from a, a national banking um, point of view. With loan loss reserves, the problem has been first cost. I mentioned that, and that's, by that I mean the money to seed the um, loan loss reserve. I, um, I mentioned that because the um, ERA funds, which have been so um, productive in, in um, facilitating these loan loss reserve funds um, all over the country, I mean dozens of examples, um, that money is clearly not uh, a recurring event. And so while it has addressed that issue in some programs, looking ahead, um, we're back to that same problem, which is to start a loan loss reserve fund, you need to um, have initial funding. Uh, and, and quickly that turns into an issue of where is that, um, that funding going to come from. Um, so in conclusion, for, the, for this um, intro portion that um, I've been going through, uh, the highlights that I'd like to repeat to you are that um, financing programs, in order to be effective and to be um, um, utilized, need to have availability of long repayment terms. Um, they frequently um, get best results by having um, a dedicated uh, structure um, like utility bills, tax assessments, mortgages, rather than personal credit, and that's true both for those who, who can qualify and can't. Um, experience has shown that programs that uh, utilize these structures have lower default rates and, and are just um, more soundly designed all around. Um, programs need to look at ways to get potential participants um, to be able to obtain financing who are not otherwise. Uh, that really points to loan loss reserves uh, that are targeted for people who cannot otherwise qualify as opposed to, um, for example, a program that's available to all in which uh, you might have uh, quite a bit of what's called termed free ridership where people who were going to do this anyway will, will take advantage of a financial incentive. And an interest rate buy-down is a perfect example of that. So in conclusion, I just wanted to, to highlight the fact that as we look at uh, the array of uh, financing mechanisms that have been attempted and things that we're looking at here, the ones that seem to be the most promising as we stand today are the ones that we have the least experience with. Um, you can view that as a negative, saying that nothing we've tried um, has worked, or you can view it as a positive, saying that uh, as the need grows, more and more um, innovative thinking is, um, is being applied to this and, um, and will ultimately um, meet that market demand. So um, that concludes my portion. Thank you.
Great. Well, thank you so much, Peter. That, that, was, uh, that was a great um, uh, overview of the, the range of issues that we're wrestling with and some of the, uh, the interesting um, ideas that, uh, that are out there for trying to address the, um, the challenges that we've faced thus far with financing. Um, there's been a couple of questions that have come in, um, so we'll, maybe we'll take a couple of them and then uh, move on to, uh, to Dennis's presentation since we got a little bit of a late start and, and had a few uh, glitches, uh, technical glitches along the way. Um, so, uh, and so if we have time at the end of Dennis's to address any other questions that come in, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do that. Uh, the, the first question, Peter, that came in had to do with the public purpose ESCO, uh, and it asks, um, how would one s you, you, you mentioned that there, uh, there needs to be one of the hurdles there is that there needs to be a significant amount of upfront investment uh, to, to put a public purpose ESCO in place. And the question that came in is how would one um, set uh, the, the threshold level of investment that you need to make it work, and um, what would be the standards for deciding uh, what that threshold level of investment would be? Okay. Um, well, I guess uh, the first point to be made is this is all prospective. We, we don't know yet. Um, the, the firm I work for, Vermont Energy Investment Corporation, is very interested in this concept and is, uh, is exploring it uh, on many different fronts. Um, I think the, the portion that's easy to answer is the most ESCO-like projects are most likely to work in the initial stages. So by that I mean um, institutional buildings, um, very homogeneous, perhaps doing the very same measures that an ESCO would do, plus some additional measures, would allow for... Um, uh, a rate of return and a predictable level of, sailing, of savings uh, that would allow a public purpose ESCO to um, have a high level of confidence in generating the energy savings that they project. Um, over time and with, uh, with successful experience, you could work your way down the continuum um, away from all those attributes more towards, for example, multifamily housing um, where you have issues with um, you know, homeowner maintains um, buildings, multiple tenants, and so on, things that, that make ESCOs justifiably leery of working on some of these projects um, are, are things that could be um, reviewed by a public purpose ESCO, uh, you know, with the benefit of experience of, of prior successful projects. Okay, great, thank you. So um, a, a second question, and this had to do with the, the point you made, Peter, about uh, borrowers' skepticism of future energy savings, um, and, and actually, I think you made the point that it's not just borrowers' uh, borrowers' skepticism of future savings, but the lenders as well. That that's that's a barrier. Uh, but the, the question was, could a um, a loan loss reserve or alternatively um, a loan guarantee uh, uh, address uh, or mitigate um, uh, that skepticism or the or the barriers that that skepticism seems to put up to these types of investments? Um, absolutely, and I, and I think that as a matter of public policy, that's a pretty key um, concept because the, the facts, the numbers show that energy savings are pretty predictable. Um, I did mention some things about some behavioral changes and so on, but still, um, you know, by and large, um, projects that are done uh, frequently have expectations um, before they begin of what level of savings will be obtained, and it is quite common for that level of savings to be, um, the actual to be quite close to the um, expected. So what that means is, is that there's a gap between the actual experience and what um, people are guessing might happen. Um, uh, certainly the public sector could, could serve a valuable role in um, providing that loan loss reserve, or again, you use the word guarantee, you know, guarantee is a, is a blank check. Um, loan lo a properly constructed loan loss reserve should um, largely address that um, concern without having to leave that wide open um, exposure. Um, so I would, I would urge consideration of loan loss reserves over guarantees uh, in all cases. Um, but yes, a, a, a properly constructed program could allow the public sector to, um, to make private financers comfortable that even if the savings don't emerge, their um, investments will be safe. And the expectation then would be that over time, uh, as a track record is developed, the increasingly you could point to the historical experience rather than rely upon loan loss reserves. Okay, great. Um, and then uh, another question regarding uh, the discussion you had, Peter, on, on PACE and uh, your observation that one of the obstacles to PACE uh, is that there is no national standard. Um, 
uh, two things. One, could you um, elaborate a little bit more on, on what kind of standard you think would be, uh, would be helpful here? What are the issues specifically you need to address? And then secondly, given that there doesn't seem to be any national standard forthcoming in the near term, um, what solution might there be? Is there, and, and I would maybe elaborate on that question to ask, is there some kind of uh, uh, you know, voluntary national uh, um, uh, getting together of the, of the advocates of PACE that, that could uh, potentially, even if the government isn't going to develop a standard, um, develop one amongst themselves? Right. Um, okay, so, so there are two, uh, I think, aspects to that. The first one is that, you know, ironically, when FHFA um, issued their letter in July of 2010, it was literally just weeks before um, some $180 million of ERA funds were about to be distributed to half a dozen or so different programs around the country to start PACE programs. Um, the Department of Energy had issued best practices um, which uh, included positive savings to investment ratio, minimum uh, equity in the property, and so on, um, that would have created a de facto national standard because if half a dozen of the 26 states are all adhering to the same set of guidelines, that then creates a, a baseline that the other states can compare themselves to. Um, one of the um, ultimate objectives, I think, of, of the PACE concept is that um, the, the, the concept of a PACE loan um, could become something that is uh, standardized in its meaning just the way the concept of a uh, conforming mortgage, which can be sold to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, has a, has a constant meaning throughout the country. So if um, it emerged that because these states that follow the Department of Energy's best practices um, are able to provide a large supply of homogeneous PACE loans and therefore are able to be bundled together and perhaps sold as, uh, in the secondary market as, um, as PACE secondary um, uh, asset-backed securities, that would uh, create a, a major incentive for other states to conform to those programs so that their um, PACE loans could be securitized as well. Um, that is largely the thinking, in answer to the second part of your question, Chris, that is largely the thinking behind this um, bill that was just introduced in the House uh, with bipartisan sponsorship, by the way. I haven't used the word, bi word bipartisan in a while. Um, and uh, that's uh, the, the characteristics of uh, a PACE loan, an eligible PACE loan in that, um, in that bill states that um, many of these same characteristics about the positive savings to investment ratio, minimum equity, and so on. So um, that would, again, have the effect of having uh, a national standard. And I do think that if a group of states, particularly if one of them is a very large state, um, join together and have common characteristics, that the, the likelihood is that other states would quickly fall in line um, if there were a, a benefit to doing so, that being the secondary um, bond market. Great. Um, so we'll do one last question, and then we're going to we'll stop and uh, switch it over to Dennis. Um, the, uh, and I think this is an, an easy one for you, Peter. The, the, the question had to do with whether there's ongoing technical support resources available to cities who are launching ERA-supported loan loss reserve type programs. I, I know VEIC is actually the prime contractor to the U.S. Department of Energy um, to, uh, to provide technical support to ERA grantees on energy efficiency issues, and I believe that there is a different organization that's um, uh, been set aside to deal with uh, ESCO issues and, and from a technical support perspective. Um, could you uh, uh, elaborate a little bit on, on any of that, or, or would you prefer to, to follow up um, offline? Um, I think that I, I don't have much more to add to what you said. Um, it is certainly the case that the Department of Energy has made available technical assistance to ERA recipients. Um, as you just stated, they are uh, broken out by teams into areas of expertise. Um, I don't have the website or the information at the tip of my fingers, but um, I'd be happy to speak with somebody directly uh, and, and help put them in touch with. Um, if you are an ERA recipient, there is technical, assessment, uh, te technical assistance available to you at no charge um, from um, many of the firms that, uh, that, that have expertise and have helped other ERA recipients uh, implement programs. Okay. So uh, that question came from, from Forrest Bradley Wright in, uh, in New Orleans, I believe. Um, thanks for the question, Forrest. And I guess what I would encourage you to do, Forrest, if you, if you want to follow up, is, is send Peter an email 
um, and he can put you in touch with. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, with the, the it's the Department of Energy Solutions Center, DOE Solutions Center. But yes, please contact me, and I'll make sure you get um, that information. Okay. So um, uh, there's there are other questions that are continuing to come in, but I'm gonna I'm gonna hold it, uh, stop it there for for the moment. Um, switch it over to Dennis and make sure we've got time to run through his presentation and address some specific questions to uh, the, uh, the, the the details that he's going to run through on um, uh, on bill financing, a utility run on bill financing program. And if we have time at the end, we'll come back to the questions we weren't able to get to. So um, uh, so with that, uh, let me introduce Dennis. Um, uh, Dennis uh, works for the United Illuminating Company in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, he's been there for uh, for more than 30 years in a variety of different um, capacities, um, the last of 11 of which uh, have been in the uh, energy efficiency group there, uh, uh, where he has been responsible for running the Small Business Energy Advantage Program uh, since the year 2000. Um, he's also on the board of directors of the Connecticut chapter of the Northeast Energy Efficiency Council. Um, I don't know whether uh, UI, as it is affectionately known, um, has the, the oldest um, utility on bill financing program. If it doesn't, it's certainly one of them. Um, and uh, so they have a, a more than a decade of, of experience to, uh, to present here. Um, so we're going from the, the broader uh, kind of big picture look at these, uh, these various promising uh, new, new options, new financing options that Peter talked about to do a little bit of a deeper dive on one of them. So uh, without further ado, um, Dennis, uh, you've got the floor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Pete for that presentation. I took a lot of notes myself. Uh, again, this will be more focused uh, on the program itself and hopefully uh, over the 11 years the trends uh, that we have seen both in the marketing of the program, uh, the first two years a uh, baptism by fire, and uh, some of the uh, things we've learned, uh, mistakes and some of the opportunities hopefully uh, I can share with you and it'll help. Uh, I can go to the first screen there. Okay. Uh, again, in 2000 is when the Connecticut Energy Efficiency Fund uh, was formed, uh, and it is by uh, funds on a customer's bill. And uh, right now, CLMP represents roughly 80% of the state of Connecticut, and we represent the other 20% in southern Connecticut, uh, greater Bridgeport, New Haven area. Uh, programs are, are a turnkey program uh, to help the small business customer. Uh, it provides cost-effective uh, conservation load ma management for those customers. And what qualifies as a small customer? Uh, technically speaking, it's under 200 kW, and uh, what that equates to is anything from a mom and pop store uh, that has a $150 monthly bill up to mid-sized manufacturing with roughly a $20,000 month electric bill. So we do those mid-sized grocery stores, the IGA markets, and not the national chains. Uh, examples of those are retail convenience stores, uh, houses of worship, professional offices, uh, common areas of apartment buildings, uh, warehouses, and sport facilities. Uh, the idea behind this is that uh, they don't have the professional uh, expertise uh, on their premises, and we provide that. Uh, our customer base is roughly 325,000 customers, of which 30,000 uh, are CNI, commercial, industri industrial, and municipal. And of those, uh, just under 17,000 uh, fall under the category of small business. And uh, since the program started uh, in 2000, uh, we've done over 4,500. Uh, projects, uh, and it's usually closely associated to the money that you have each year, roughly 400 a year we do based on the money. When the money is out, the money is out. Uh, so right now, after the uh, 11 years, uh, we found that it's, it's more difficult uh, because a lot of the low-hanging fruit uh, were taken in the first years, and now we're getting more into comprehensive uh, as we move forward. Uh, through the program years, uh, because besides that 4,550 uh, projects that we've done uh, out of the 17,000 customers, there's also new construction, that is uh, new technology. Uh, 
So we may have well be a, well over 50% uh, of our customer base, small business customer base, has been addressed. Uh, pretty much the offering is a no obligation energy audit to the customer. We want to make it easy for that customer. Uh, there are no upfront co costs. Uh, the incentives they change year and year, uh, year to year, uh, based on approval from the uh, Public Utilities Commission. Uh, this year it is up to 40% uh, lighting and nine lighting measures. Uh, there is a uh, comprehensive uh, bonus uh, that can bring it up to 50%. And uh, since its inception, uh, it has been 0% uh, percent on bill financing. Uh, some utilities have struggled with trying to get that line item on the bill. We have always had uh, the ability to have a line item on our bill for revolving charges, such as uh, hot water rentals, et cetera. Uh, and we chose to, to just work with the 0% financing that it's uh, uh, easier uh, to work with uh, both on the billing side. Uh, statistics since 2000, again, over 4,450 installed projects. Uh, the average project cost usually runs between 10 and 12,000. Uh, average project savings is about 16,000 kilowatt hours uh, per project. Uh, average savings uh, between 20 and 25 percent uh, on your lighting and refrigeration. Uh, once we get into comprehensive, which uh, in the later years, 2006 on, uh, we're doing now more of the comprehensive, such as the HVAC, um, air compressors, et cetera. Uh, during this time, uh, we've saved uh, just under a billion lifetime kilowatt hours. Uh, and on the event environmental side, equates to just under 600,000 tons of avoided carbon dioxide. Continue with the statistics, um, $12.3 million uh, in incentives have been paid off during this time, uh, and we have financed uh, $33.1 million in 0% loans. Uh, We've had defaults of under 330,000, which is less than 1% of the loan defaults. Uh, the funds are, uh, incentives are from the fund, and the loan amounts uh, are from uh, our company, from UI shareholders. Uh, we had, about two years ago, got an approval to, to move from a $4.5 million limit at any time of outstanding loans up to 7.5 million at this current time. Are with me? Following on the loans, uh, minimum loan is $250. Anything less than that, uh, they just come out of pocket with. A maximum loan is up to $100,000. Uh, maximum loan term is 48 months. And uh, the average loan term that we're using right now is about 30 months. Uh, our qualification, uh, we don't go outside to uh, credit bureaus. We just use util utility payment history. And uh, what we use is less than 30, uh, less than 60-day uh, arrears in the most recent six months. So in other words, today is the 27th of July. You get your July bill. If you still have your uh, June bill, that's no problem. If you still have your May bill, that's a problem because uh, that will uh, show as a uh, – uh, carry a disconnect notice. So in the most recent six months, uh, you have to be less than 60-day arrears. Now, of all the leads that we get in, 93% uh, of the customers do qualify for that financing. Uh, and of those that do qualify, roughly 54% decide to participate in the program. Uh, important uh, point here of the 7% who don't qualify for financing, in other words, they would have to come out of pocket with the balance after the incentive is paid, after that uh, up to 40% is paid, only 19% decide to participate in the program. Uh, mo most of those small businesses, especially uh, in the uh, larger cities, uh, just don't have those funds to move forward. Uh, on the loan side, 80% of our participants are tenants. 
So whoever the bill is in the name of, those are the ones that get to authorize the work. Uh, multiple on bill loan capacity we do have uh, for, for different phases if they just want to do the lighting now and then continue on the following year. Um, uh, usually we try to tell them that the more comprehensive in nature, the, the higher the incentive. Uh, it just makes more sense, but we do have that capability. Uh, the loans are transferable or assumable. Uh, so in sales transactions, if a new person takes over the business, uh, it can be uh, transferred to the new customer's account. Uh, or if a customer closes up and they uh, move, uh, then we can transfer it to, to where they are uh, relocated. Uh, the defaults are recovered by the public funds. So part of my budget that I have each year, I have a single line item, and we are allowed to, uh, to cover any defaults that are out there. But what, that's with the understanding that we do re, uh, maintain under a 1% uh, default rate. Uh, utility is allowed to earn interest on the funds uh, that they supply for that financing. Uh, because obviously the, the money that we use, there's a cost associated with that. Uh, and the partial payments are applied to the loan installment first. So uh, we have a payment routine where revolving charges uh, such as uh, the monthly rental, water heater rentals, uh, or a small business loan, a partial payment would pay for that first, leaving the utility, uh, uh, the utility usage as outstanding. Uh, because the small business loan cannot carry a disconnect uh, notice. Excuse me. Typical measures that we do out there, uh, high performance lighting. And when we first started in 2000, it was basically just lighting. About halfway through the year, uh, we had the, uh, the lighting uh, contractors trained in uh, refrigeration control technology. Uh, and then we've moved since uh, to HVAC, programmable thermostats, uh, rooftop unit replacements, uh, economizers, uh, a limited amount of air compressors, um, and uh, VFDs, premium efficiency motors. Uh, and now, uh, this past year, we purchased the Southern Connecticut Gas Company, and we have been ordered by the state to start folding gas incentives also. Uh, so we are going to be uh, training our contractors in auditing of uh, gas equipment. And uh, we'll, at this time, we don't have the on-bill financing for them, but as we see in 2012, uh, we will be uh, folding that into our financing uh, on our bill. Uh, typical, uh, this is actual job we did uh, where before the customer's bill was a $3,000 monthly bill. Uh, they had obsolete lighting, and we try to stress obsolete lighting, especially with the T12 technology now, uh, because they've stopped the manufacturing of that, uh, and it's uh, really a good tool to use in selling the job that in the years to follow, they won't even be able to find or be paying premium price for replacing T12. Uh, but a typical place like this with no lighting controls, refrigeration, 24-7 uh, refrigeration and poorly maintained HVAC equipment. Uh, by the time we got finished with the customer uh, with all the measures, uh, it turned out to be roughly an $1,800 a month electric bill. And here's a picture of that job that we did. Uh, we do a lot with LED induction lighting now. The, induct, uh, the LED in the refrigeration cases uh, make such a, uh, an appearance upgrade to a, a business. It looks like they put a new floor in, they painted the place, but really it's just the efficiency. And then we use the LED. It pulls all the heat out of the refrigeration and make the compressors run less. Uh, so we've seen lighting and refrigeration combinations uh, that are saving in the 40% uh, area of a customer's bill. Uh, the loan strategy, I have original loan strat term strategy uh, for the first six and a half years to 
seven years. Uh, we used our, our software, and our software, uh, the contractors all, when they become part of the program, we put out an RFP and to select contractors, and it's usually based on the uh, amount of money that we have to spend for the year, the amount of projects. Uh, this year I have roughly uh, $2 million in incentive money and uh, 7.7 .7 million kilowatt hour, annual kilowatt hours to save. Uh, so based on that, uh, we see that we need an infrastructure of approximately 14 companies, contracting companies, to accomplish that. Um, and with this loan term strategy, for the first seven years, to keep everything going, to keep the participation up, uh, this, the software that they use would generate uh, documentation that would uh, default it out. In this case, in the red, you see monthly payment of 16 months. It was roughly a 1.2 year payback. So it would kick it up one month to make it slightly cash positive. Uh, here in red, you see $6,927 the customer is saving uh, a year, which is roughly $577 a month. Uh, so the cash positive on this is roughly $25. And the thought behind that is telling the customer, look, at you sit down to, fill out, to send in your electric bill uh, from the first month on, you'll be paying less each month on your electric bill uh, than you were paying before. If you decide not to participate, you're still going to be paying that same amount each month, but it'll be a higher amount because you still have the inefficiency. Um, after t in 2007, we were looking at possibility of raising the incentive levels but instead we decided to go to a loan extension strategy. And on this next uh, sh slide, it'll show you that same scenario where it was a, a 1.2 year payback. Uh, so what we did is just extend the loan out to 24 months. So now the customer is still saving uh, $577 a month estimated savings, uh, but that monthly payment is $368. And what we found, uh, because they're seeing that greater cash uh, positive transaction, uh, that at the time we were running about 45% participation rate. And when we started the strategy of a loan extension, it moved it up to around 55%. And that's what not pouring more money into it, because the more incentive you pour into it, the less customers you can serve for that year. And this is just an example of the, the bill, uh, typical bill. And on the bottom uh, in red is the loan installment for that particular customer, $516 per month. Uh, and then they have their current charges. And just below the box where it says amount now due uh, would have the actual account balance. And that actual amount balance of the 16331 is the remain, remainder of the small business loan. It is not due at this time because it hasn't been billed. It's only billed on a monthly basis. Uh, so, uh, But that is part of the outstanding loan in the event that the customer did uh, close up their business. And here, the critical pieces uh, of running this program uh, one thing, in the, back in the 90s, I worked in commercial collections, so that's where a lot of this background really came from. Um, we found that we were out in, in uh, the field addressing a lot of these problems, and we saw the customers had a good product, and they had good customer service, but just the equipment they had was uh, so old that they couldn't overcome uh, the cost of running it. And unfortunately, we had to put a lot of them out of business. Uh, so when this opportunity for me to uh, move into conservation came up in 2000, I jumped at it because uh, a lot of these places we were able to go out and keep them in business. Uh, but establishing the credit is very important. We stick to the under 60-day uh, arrears. Uh, and I would say if you're starting any kind of on-bill financing, uh, stick to a credit and, and uh maintain that. Um, it, it's pretty much using the idea of we're going to give 
uh, our 0% loans out to a customer that is in the habit of paying it back on a regular basis. And uh, it's a pretty simple philosophy, but that has a, uh, equated to uh, less than 1% default. Uh, the, the vendor uh, infrastructure that we have, again, this year we have 14 uh, contracting companies. Um, we had put out an RFP, uh, and we had 56 co companies that were interested, of which 23 uh, replied, and we selected 14. Uh, many of these contractors are also working in the Connecticut Light and Power Territory. It is a statewide program offering the, with the same offerings for the small business program. Um, one thing, if you are running a small business program uh, and you have your contractors out there, you want to make sure that they're representing your company and representing what you want to do to help your customers. So on a quarterly basis, um, we have uh, evaluations for those contractors. Uh, we set up 10 criteria uh, to produce uh, kilowatt hour savings, uh, to produce installed projects, uh, to install comprehensive projects. Uh, then we have time frame as far as response to the customer, etc. Uh, and that's important in making sure that what's going on out there uh, is what you want going out there because they do represent the program and your company. Uh, the standards uh, that we use in the program are pretty much established through the software that they all use. Once they become a contractor, they'll have access uh, to Internet, uh, which is our software program, capital E, Internet. And uh, they are following uh, a program savings document that is approved by the state of Connecticut in the cal uh, calculation uh, methods for uh, any of the end uses that are out there. Uh, they will build it. So generally, a customer, a contractor will either uh, solicit a lead or we will send a lead to them. They're responsible for 80% of the leads. They have to do lead solicitation. And then we will uh, uh, supplement that with leads that we get through the WISE use number, which is the 1-800 number for the state of Connecticut, uh, through our call center and through business events. Uh, we'll supplement them with the rest of the leads. Uh, the lead is given to them. They will go out, do the audit um, prior to that. Uh, the software, when we give them the lead, they'll have access to a 36-month history for that customer. Uh, and we stress them looking at that so they'll see the basic uh, uh, or current usage, usage habits for those customers. Uh, so even before you get out there, and, and I'll speak to you as if I'm speaking to a new contractor, before you even go into that building, if you know they're using roughly 80,000 kilowatt hours during the year, you have a potential of, uh, if it's comprehensive, to, to uh, probably save up to 40% or between 30 and 40%. So that's a valuable tool to go in there because when you start building a project, if all of a sudden your numbers are coming out that you're saving 60, 70%, uh, it should uh, put up a flag that you m must be putting in the wrong usage or hours of operation, uh, or there could be possibly a second meter out there uh, that may be under a second name because you could have one that's Tony's Deli and the, the other one that's uh, uh, under his personal name that's on the corner, so they have two meters. So it, it gives them indication of that energy usage. So the billing usage is, is a valuable tool even before they walk in the door. Uh, and then we have the standards for them building it. Uh, they will ask for approval, and on our side, we go into the system, uh, we approve everything. Uh, the documentation is sent to, to them, so all the contractors are using uh, a common uh, documentation for the small business program with the utility uh, header on that. Uh, and it, it, it helps them in the sale of that uh, because all day long con uh, customers are being solicited uh, by uh, distributed generation companies, et cetera. Uh, so they want to make sure that the UI or CLMP or the utility is backing what's going on. Um, on the billing uh, piece of the puzzle, 
Uh, we do have the flexibility of multi-line items. Um, Connecticut Light and Power, uh, about two years ago, they, they finally had on-bill financing. Uh, prior to that, they did have a second bill that went out, the regular utility bill, and then the customer would receive one with a small business loan. Uh, now, their, their uh, default rates at that time were still low. It was under 2%, but it was still double what we ours were. And now, uh, since the DPUC has uh, ordered them to put on bill financing and has gone down because a customer, uh, and this goes back to the credit uh, commercial credit days, a customer wants to keep their lights on, so they're more likely to pay their utility bill. So as a line item on that bill, uh, it's more likely to be uh, that small business loan is likely to be uh, paid if it uh, appears on their bill. And again, uh, the, the, what we do, we give bills to the customer or we give the loans to customers that are in the habit of paying it back all the time. Uh, so if anything, uh, this isn't becoming a burden on top of what they're normally paying we're making it a cash positive transaction, so we're lightening the load. Uh, that shouldn't have any effect on their habits of paying paying the bill back. Uh, next, the energy savings. Uh, again, uh, we're held responsible with the state of Connecticut with that energy. Um, we try to be conservative in the amount of energy we're saying uh, that's going to be saved. Uh, so that's part of the approval process that we do here. If we see high amounts, uh, we'll send it back to the contractor, say, uh, uh, to uh, recalculate or, or contract or contact the customer to make sure those hours of operation are right. Because uh, what we always tell them, I never get a phone call from a customer complaining because they're saving more than we told them, but it's always the other way around. So. Um, we make sure that the energy savings is conservative and it follows the program savings documentation uh, approved by the state. And then uh, the last part, uh, which is probably the most important part, uh, we, we did the, this program on the premise if we just focus on the customer, uh, then we're doing the right thing. And that's what our focus has been. Now, the small business customer arena uh, and our audience is one that is uh, multilingual, multicultural, and I would say the most important part of this program is is overcoming the trust factor out there in the field. Uh, again, they are being solicited all day long, so when we come in there and uh, we as a utility are trying to get them to use less of our product, uh, the skeptics can be there. Uh, Definitely. Uh, I always say it's like you're selling Kellogg's and you're trying to convince them to, to buy the smaller box of cornflakes. Uh, but what we're trying to do, as we're, we explain to them, is uh, to drop the demand so that there isn't a demand for building new power plants. Uh, plus, we're mandated by the state, which is a big part of it. Uh, again, we are allowed to earn weighted cost of interest on the loans that we put out there, uh, and there is a bonus that we have for reaching uh, our goals uh, across the board, both residential and commercial. Uh, with the com customer, uh, as far as the uh, trust factors and language barriers, uh, we have been working with some of the community colleges uh, to try to create a hotline in the event that a customer or one of our contractors as an example, finds great opportunities in a Thai restaurant but can't communicate that, uh, where we could get in contact with one of the community colleges that might have a Thai student who's a uh, uh, marketing or engineering uh, uh, background that they could act as an interpreter. Uh, we've done that with some limited success. Um, in the inner cities, we've partnered with uh, the Spanish American Merchants Association and Empowerment Zone. Uh, which are specific uh, to uh, different areas of the cities and uh, where we've even trained the Spanish American Merchants Association, the administration, uh, in the sales aspect of the program, uh, and that has increased uh, participation uh, in the Latino uh, business area. So uh, 
it's a challenging program, especially as we move on in the years. Uh, in these last two years, we have gone a lot deeper in the comprehensiveness. Uh, and now with the rooftop units, uh, a lot of the customers have been folding that into the program. Uh, in many cases, because the rooftop units are more costly, it is slightly a cash negative transaction, uh, but that customer doesn't have to come up with the, the upfront costs. Uh, so many of them are, are taking that opportunity uh, to uh, sign up for that. So. My presentation is a little faster, but uh, that's pretty much what I wanted to cover. And uh, I, here's my contact information. And uh, about all I can say is that over the 11 years, they say you learn a lot by your mistakes. Uh, I must be a genius by now. <laughs> so, uh, if there's uh, any questions, uh, shoot. <laughs> great. Well, uh, thanks, Dennis. That was that was great. Um, uh, it's uh, um, uh, I think a really nice compliment to Peter's presentation to, uh, to to start at the at kind of the big picture level and then then dive down as you've done um, into the details of a program that that um, I think was a, was an innovator not only when it was launched but even today more than more than a decade later. Um, so there have been a number of questions that that come in uh, that have come in and I'll I'll try to get uh, run through them somewhat in the order in which they came in although a couple of them I think you may have um, uh, addressed uh, as you've gone further in your presentation so uh, we may we may pass by one or two um, if, if anyone if we don't have time to get to all of them and anyone feels that we haven't gotten to uh, to something you wanted to uh, to press on um, again uh, Dennis's uh, contact information is on the presentation and you can feel free to. Uh, to, to give him uh, send him an email and um, and and pose your question directly. Uh, I will note a couple of questions have come in, uh, perhaps for, from folks who arrived a little bit late to the webinar about whether the slides are going to be available uh, uh, after the presentation. Um, and I'll, I'll observe uh, first that they I think that um, uh, Meg Anion from um, from RAP uh, sent out the copies of the, the slides to everyone uh, today. But in any case, um, even if you didn't get them. Um, both the slides and the recorded uh, version of this presentation uh, will be available on RAP's uh, website uh, if you want to uh, check it out there. So um, with respect to a couple of the questions that have, that have come in, Dennis, the, the first one was um, uh, you, you guys have targeted this, this program to the small commercial customer base, and, and, and um, those of us who have been involved in energy efficiency for any length of time know that there's, there's really good reason for that. It's a very difficult uh, customer segment to get to participate in your efficiency programs. Um, but the question was asked is there, whether there's any reason why um, this type of, of, of approach of on -bill, utility on-bill financing couldn't be made available to residential customers, and I'm, I'm presuming from the question that we're, the, 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 uh, the underlying premise there was for, uh, for example, for whole house retrofits, perhaps um, particularly uh, in, the case of, in your case, since you're an electric utility, um, for uh, electrically heated customers. Well, that's a good question, and we've been getting a lot of uh, um, pressure, if I can put it that way, from the state. Uh, and uh, as of uh, January 1st, or actually as of June 1st of this year, uh, we had started a residential program uh, for uh, appliances uh, and for uh, lighting, et cetera. They can go out to 10 years. Uh, and it's also for uh, fuel, if they change to gas uh, fuel, gas heating, uh, they would even pay for the exchange of uh, the furnace, and that would be at 4.9% uh, over 10 years. If they also add hot, gas hot water to that, it would be at 2.9%. Uh, so it's just kicking off. Uh, it has to be the owner of the property in this case. Uh, that was part of the problem in the decision making uh, because we have a, a lot of transient uh, uh, residential uh, audience. Uh, and we, what we don't want to happen is that we finance a refrigerator and three months later it's in New Jersey. So uh, they have to be a, a, the owner of property uh, to partake in the financing. Uh, okay. There is also a, a municipal program, too, for each of the towns in our territory. Now, um, I'm sorry, remind me, Dennis, are you guys a, um, uh, a dual fuel utility or are you electrical alone? 
Well, we we have we are an electric company. However, uh, our our parent company has purchased uh, Connecticut Natural Gas, which is up in Hartford, and Southern Connecticut Gas, which overlaps our territory. And we've been ordered by the DPUC uh, to uh, we are the gas company right now, as far as any incentive programs. Uh, we're gotcha. Running and because both. your dual fuel, it enables you to serve um, both of those end uses simultaneously with the same customer base. Yeah, so it's quite a learning process we're going through, uh, especially with the incentives available both on commercial and residential side. So it's kind of a learning process. We have uh, an overlap. We have some of our uh, engineers working with the gas company and vice versa uh, because it's kind of happened all at once. Mm -hmm. But this okay. too shall pass. <laughs> So one of the other questions came in. Uh, you, you just referenced, um, uh, you know, the mandate that you're getting from the state and from the from the regulators. Can you talk a little bit more about um, uh, the specifics of of uh, what the state is requiring you to do? Did, did they actually um, very uh, explicitly say that you are to offer an on-bill financing initiative, or did they um, have uh, more general? obligations or mandates on you that you then determined were best met by an on-bill financing program? Uh, we we actually, back uh, prior to this, uh, uh, the formation of the Connecticut Energy Efficiency Fund in, in uh, 1993, uh, we actually started a, a small business program. That's before I came here and before the fund was. Uh, so we had some grant money, some other money, uh, and was probably in the tune of about $250,000 a year. So they may have done uh, roughly 20, 25 projects a year. So we kind of had the basis of that uh, and the on-bill financing capability. So uh, we, we took advantage of, of that uh, early start. So when this took over uh, the Connecticut Energy Efficiency Fund, and it kicked up to uh, you know one over a little over a million the first year, I believe the amount was. Uh, we we're in a position, uh, and I think we kind of pushed it uh, from the commercial uh, collection point of view uh, as far as getting payment back. If we are going to set a criteria for who's going to pay it back, um, we felt the best way to have it was on bill, and with that capability, we just went with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, uh, a related question that came in had to do with the, the, the point that you made that if there's a partial payment of the bill, um, the partial payment is applied to the loan first. Uh, and right. the, the question is, is that a company decision or is that a, um, a regulatory requirement? That's a company decision. Okay. Um, now, what, what we're finding, again, that 1%, and you know, maybe I'll talk about that 1%, that, that is default. Um, we found that most of those cases have been a bankruptcy, and some were quite surprising. Uh, they were around for years, very strong, and then, boom, the next thing you know, uh, three months after it's installed, uh, they're gone. Uh, and, and again, we are able to um, uh, recover that from the conservation fund with the understanding that we keep that low default rate. Um, so I think, uh, you know, everyone looks at the risk factor, um, I, I try to keep in mind that if anything, we're lowering the risk of uh, inefficiency being out there. For all intents and purposes, we give all customers a one-month loan, uh, a one-month uh, service of electricity in hopes that they're going to pay for it at the end of the month. So if anything, we're lowering that amount of electricity that they're going to be using uh, via efficiency. So. Um, uh, from a risk standpoint, um, I think we're pretty well covered. Mm -hmm. Seems okay. to have worked up to now. <laughs> okay. So a, a related question about um, about regulatory mandates. Uh, so, someone wanted to know what um, what the uh, um, the regula a little bit more about the regulatory context um, that helped uh, to drive your uh, your interest in and, and pushing of the program in terms of uh, the energy efficiency savings targets that the state may have for you. If I recall correctly, at least a couple of years ago, Connecticut utilities were saving something like an incremental annual 1% uh, of sales. Is that uh, similar today? Are you guys uh, now higher yes. than that? What, what, yes, that, that would be. Yeah. Okay. 
So, yeah, so uh, the push uh, really was the push really was when they created this uh, that at the same time they deregulated de us, and uh, we had to sell our uh, our uh, generation plants. And uh, the idea behind this was to uh, keep us from uh, having to build new plants and introducing uh, the the broker to hopefully keep the prices down. So uh -huh. I don't know if they've quite gotten there. Uh, it's made for an interesting business now. Okay. Um, another question came in about uh, collateral for the loan. If I if I understand correctly, you don't actually do you actually have any collateral for the loan um uh, I'm, no. I wasn't I, I didn't think so and no. uh, what what happens if the customer that you're that you're working with um ha is already borrowing money from lenders for some other purpose and has some constraints on their borrowing ability uh further borrowing ability imposed by those other lenders how do you find out about that or um or do you no, we we don't. We we had made a decision to strictly go by the um, paying habits on their utility bill. Mm -hmm. okay. And so and again, it, if in fact it's going to uh, bring in uh, the gas uh, incentives, we would also refer to their paying habits on the gas bill. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if the customer has any constraints from other lenders, that's uh, that's their business and um, uh, that that they need to resolve. You're simply concerned with whether they have a, a good history of, of paying your bills, and if they yes. do, then they're in. okay. Uh, another question that came up around um, the types of projects and measures that you're getting savings from, um, and it's uh, you know I, I think a typical uh, uh, an important question around how much of the projects or how much of the the savings maybe is a different way of framing it are coming from from lighting uh, measures as opposed to everything else. Do you have a ballpark sense of that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely on that, and um, it's a it's an important question too because lighting usually helps buy down the cost of everything else. And everything else is usually, uh, with the exception of refrigeration. Refrigeration can pretty much stand alone. Uh, the lighting uh, probably represents about 72% of all of our energy savings. And mm -hmm. then uh, you're probably looking at a, a, another 15% uh, that is refrigeration. And then uh, the balance of that is your HVAC and uh, uh, process, et cetera. Okay. The lighting usually drives it, and th that has posed a, a problem in some areas. And I'll give you an example. Today, we had a convenience store that was done about five years or six years ago, and they did all the lighting and refrigeration, uh, which is the low hanging fruit. Now, uh, what they want to do now is replace their rooftop unit, and uh, as that came through to us, uh, it, it's just not going to make the uh, uh, the criteria, uh, it, it looks like it's about a 17-year payback uh, because, you know, this part of the country, the amount of energy savings is just not going to uh, make it with the cost of the rooftop unit. Now, if we had poured in the lighting and refrigeration, we could probably br br buy it down or bring it down to a four-year payback. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um Let's see. We had a question about your your requirement for six months uh, service and the implications it might have for for new customers, um, those that may not have uh, may not have had six months of, of billing history with you. Um, how do you deal with with them? Do you simply wait for for them to have a long enough billing history with you to allow them into the program? Well, there's a couple of different programs. One thing we we tell them um, first of all, they haven't paid into the program. Uh, or, uh, you know, so as far as getting incentives, they haven't really paid into the program. A lot of the customers uh, that have been in the program for a few years have actually paid into the program. So we're uh, part of the sales is we, we have this money, and it's actually your money, and we want to give it back to you in the form of, of efficiency. Uh, so that's kind of explained to the customer that they have to be in business uh, for two different reasons besides that. One is that we can establish what are your current usage patterns, and what is your current you know, uh, payment, repayment patterns? It, it's kind of hard to tell them what they're going to save uh, if we don't know what they use at this point. Uh, so we have worked with some where we have a waiver of energy savings, uh, and 
they would sign that uh, three or four months into it, uh, saying at this point, you know, if they can't wait and they have people there uh, that are, you know, they want to change those lights, uh, then we'll tell them there'll be a waiver of uh, uh, energy savings. So it's going to be strictly based on um, wattage reduction. We don't really have hours of operation to work with to, to uh -huh. you know, work with the calculation. So it's going to be a minimum amount of savings. Uh, the other program is Express Rebate, and that's just a per fixture, uh, roughly $10 per fixture. Um, that would be paid for them. And, and again, that can be used. That's under the Small Business Express Rebate, uh, and that's where uh, you know their cousin who's an electrician wants to do the work, uh, and they're going to put it in. We say, well, uh, you, we can do that, but you'll have to run it through the Express Rebate. So the rebate incentive amount will be a lot less. So in essence, what you what you really have for customers in those situations is is other program options that they can pursue rather than the the on bill financing one. Sure, but uh, the third option I always tell them I say, listen, if you can, you've been in business for four months right now. If you can hang in there for two months, uh, you, you seem to have a good credit right now. Just keep this up for another two months, mm -hmm. and then at that point, take advantage, and we can do a more comprehensive approach for you. So we uh, haven't good. run into a lot of problems uh, with that, but they come up. Sure. Uh, okay. So you, you talked, Dennis. You talked a little bit about, um, uh, in, in several different points in your presentation, about um, the importance of the customer and um, things that you've done. You talked about, uh, uh, for example, um, outreach to uh, different retailer associations, including uh, uh, you know, roping in. Um, uh, foreign language uh, speaking uh, aids and and so on. Um, uh, could you elaborate a little bit more about how it is that um, beyond that, uh, how it is that customers find out about this program? How do you um, uh, what kind of outreach, uh, other outreach mechanisms do you use to get them engaged? Because you you do have a fairly substantial over the course of the of the of the period, fairly substantial participation rate. Uh, and then secondly, what do you do to make it um, uh, to make the transaction costs uh, easy. You've clearly, you know, the, the financing and the financial incentives are clearly attractive. Are there? Is it uh, um, uh, a really simple form that they simply need to, to, to fill out with the help of the uh, the vendor that you've got on on hand? Uh, so the two part question: How do you recruit them, uh, market to them in the first place, and then secondly, are, uh, what, are, what systems do you have in place to minimize the transaction cost for them to participate? Okay. Um. Well, I, I probably, as far as the marketing, it uh, we're kind of in a different phase now. In the first few years, uh, we did a lot of uh, advertising, uh, both in the newspapers, uh, direct mailing. And I, I think over the years, um, the vendors have probably uh, helped with uh, the sales of it now. Uh, again, 80% of the, the leads out there are vendor solicited. So uh, in the early stages, we started with uh, a target area strategy where if I gave uh, vendor A uh, a business at 100 Park Avenue, uh, they would be responsible for 98 and across the street 101, so they should do that whole particular area there. Uh, so we did a lot of direct mailing, a lot of business expos, um, uh, advertising, I said, in the paper, uh, in our bill inserts. Um, as we moved on, I think the the vendors, first of all, have all been uh, directed to take before and after photos of everything they do, so they build portfolios of, of uh, similar type businesses. Uh, so if they're out in an area and they're going into a warehouse, they can have photos of other warehouses they've done in some of the other towns. Um, they all have uh, IDs. Uh, that show that they're representing the utility. I strongly suggest that uh, because out there, again, the small business customer, you walk in on them and they're busy making a pizza or slicing cold cuts and they're getting solicited all day long. They do stop in here if it's the utility. So uh, it helps them get their foot in the door. Um, and uh, I think now, because of the amount of customers we've done, uh, the word is out in the neighborhood. Uh, we have moved from a direct mailing where we used to send out 
uh, brochures on the small business, and it would have a reply card. Uh, when I first got in here, I'd never worked in marketing before, but we helped design the card and everything, and we were getting back about uh, 2% return. And at the time, you know, me coming in here with my background, and I had no marketing background, I'm saying, boy, that seems lousy, a waste of, and they say, no, that's good in the marketing. Well, uh, since then, what we've done, uh, we've had a more personal type letter uh, that went out to the customer uh, that, you know, during the next several months or next two months, we're going to be doing auditing in your neighborhood. Uh, several of your businesses have taken advantage of uh, the energy conservation and uh, pretty much the idea that you have absolutely nothing to lose by getting a free energy evaluation. At least you get to learn how you're using energy now. So that's pretty much the approach we've used, and we found that that, that was up uh, around a 4% uh, uh, reply rate. So that was, uh, th that's been a lot more successful. Uh, okay. Again, this, this, this is also a program where when the money runs out, the money runs out. Uh, I was at a meeting or at a presentation last month uh, for two of the towns that are going to have a chamber challenge between the two chambers for the different towns which are always good. Competition is good between towns, between chambers. And I learned that by a presentation from a, a, uh, a woman from Illinois uh, a month ago. I was listening in on one. Uh, so I took advantage of that. And they're having a cha ch uh, chamber challenge. Uh, mm -hmm. But what I told them, uh, I'm giving the, uh, it's, er, it was early July, I was giving it to them. I said a presentation like this by the end of September, or early October, I won't be giving because by then the money the money's used up. Uh, so each year, I usually have enough. This year, I have enough for roughly 400 projects. Uh, so uh, we usually have enough. It gets committed, and uh, then they go on a queue list for the, the, the next year. Last, last year, we actually closed all programs down on the 14th of September. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, I think we've we've hit the witching hour. Uh, we had several other questions that we weren't able to get to, um, and uh, I, I guess what I would uh, again, if uh, Peter and Dennis are amenable, um, encourage you to contact uh, if you were one of those who had a question that didn't get answered to to contact um, uh, one or both of them or or me, and I'll try to uh, get the the questions forwarded. Um, I, one of the questions I'll just note in passing was, um, do we know of utilities that have on-bill collections but not on-bill financing? In other words, the, um, uh, the, the utility is a collection agent, but, the, but a, a, a different lender is, is providing the funding. And um, I can say that I believe that's the way the Illinois uh, legislation was structured, although there are some issues and concerns um, uh, unrelated to that particular element uh, about the Illinois approach that one could talk about it at length if, uh, if folks are interested as well. Um, but we're going to close down the webinar for now. It's now 3 o'clock. I want to say, um, again, uh, very much a, a quick uh, and, uh, and uh, enormous thanks to both uh, Dennis and Peter for excellent presentations and to everyone else for, um, for participating uh, and, and asking a bunch of really good questions. Um, uh, again, I'd encourage you as you leave to uh, click the X button where it's uh, right next to the word exit. Um, rather than the leaving your browser um, so that you get uh, directed to a really quick survey, and we'd, again, very much appreciate if you could fill that out. Uh, so uh, thanks again to Peter and to Dennis and to everyone else for participating. Um, I will uh, uh, shortly uh, stop the recording and uh, end the webinar. Um, thanks again, and uh, have a good day, uh, rest of the day to everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.